Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's a really special uh, uh, occasion um, uh, occasion for us, uh, and I'm deeply grateful to the Climate Initiative at uh, CPR for making this wonderful occasion possible. I'm delighted to welcome Professor uh, Catherine Regwell. Uh, she doesn't need any introduction uh, to this audience. Uh, she holds one of the most prestigious chairs in international law, a uh, titular professor of public international law at Oxford and a fellow of that extraordinarily mysterious institution called All Souls College uh, uh, at Oxford. Uh, she has written extensively, I think uh, her uh, sort of bibliography was, I think, shared, uh, shared with you. She's written... Uh, the classic and the most authoritative textbooks in the field of um, international environmental law and wildlife law. Uh, and I think it's fair to say, I was trying to think of, is there any area within environmental law that Catherine hasn't covered and couldn't, 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 couldn't sort of come up with one, um, including really innovative and interesting uh, things at the cutting edge of the regulation of technologies and ge geoengineering. I believe she's directing a program on geoengineering. Uh, at the Martin School uh, at Oxford. Uh, so really, we are in for uh, quite an intellectual treat. Uh, Catherine, on behalf of the Center for Policy Research uh, and the Climate Initiative, a kind of formal and public welcome. Uh, really delighted to, uh, 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 to have you. And I should also register my thanks to uh, Lavanya and everybody who's worked with her for making this occasion uh, possible. So, Catherine. Well, thank you so much for those kind words of introduction. And let me say that it is an absolute delight to be here in Delhi again. I've been here before under the radar as a cricket tourist, but I've, uh, on this occasion, in my professional capacity, um, and I've had a very stimulating and interesting week with the Climate Initiative team at the CPR and looking forward to another dynamic and interesting week next week. My talk this evening is really a product both of that intellectual stimulation and interaction and also the fruits of two other projects. One is the new edition, she says with a plug, of International Law and the Environment, uh, which will be Boyle and Ridgewell, and thinking about the structure of it, because climate change is addressed in a chapter addressed to atmospheric issues, so it's lumped with the Ozone Convention and the Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution Treaty. So a question at the back of my mind is that's a really geographic way of dividing up the substance of the book, and is that the right way in the right place to locate climate change? The, the second impetus for my remarks tonight is the burgeoning literature on what is called international climate change law. And I have to ask myself, and indeed you may ask, what is international climate change law? Is it a subset of international environmental law, to which I would then pose the question, we deliberately call our book International Law and the Environment in explicit recognition that we're dealing with the application of general international law to environmental actors and activities. And of course, we can then think of the wider circle of, of general international law. Uh, so my remarks tonight about international environmental law and climate change, a 30% solution, question mark, are very much driven by those uh, intercepting imperatives, the structure of the book. And then I forgot the second strand, of course, which is revisiting a piece I wrote four years ago on international environmental law and climate change, and coming back to revisit that in the light of both the burgeoning academic literature and then, of course, in the light of the uh, imminent uh, Paris Agreement, whatever form it takes uh, at the end of this year. So the structure of my talk uh, is divided between some general introductory remarks, then looking, as any good lawyer should do, at the text, firstly, of the climate instruments, and then of some of the key multilateral environmental agreements to see how they actually address their relationship with one another, explicitly or implicitly, both in the text of the treaties, but in the subsequent practice of the parties, COP decisions and the like. Um, 
And then I'll come to some concluding remarks in terms of the intersection of climate change and international environmental law. I do have a little section on geoengineering, but I suspect that I'm not going to have time allocated to me uh, to uh, discuss that in my formal presentation, but I'm very happy to take questions. The project just wound up a month ago, uh, so it's still very much uh, to the forefront of my mind. Well, as we all know, the impact of climate change has been described as the most significant environmental challenge of our time and a truly global issue since the location of greenhouse gas emissions in terms of their climate change effects is relatively unimportant. It is, as Boyle and Galley put it, a global problem par excellence. The key legal texts underpinning the climate change regime are two related multilateral environmental agreements, MEAs, to save some time, um, the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol, which are widely recognized as important international environmental law milestones in their own right in terms of their contribution to the general development of international environmental law. So there's no doubt that the corpus of general international environmental law and rules and principles has been enriched through the further elaboration in the climate regime of principles like precaution or the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And perhaps the most striking aspects of the Kyoto Protocol with its flexibility mechanisms. But in identifying climate change as a super wicked global problem par excellence, some commentators use it as a benchmark against which to assess the efficacy of international environmental as a whole. Because if it's accepted, despite some clear bottom-up tendencies, that international regulation provides the indispensable basis for collective action to tackle climate change based on internationally agreed objectives and common standards, the question then follows whether it's necessarily the current structure of the global climate regime created by the UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol, and the 2005, uh, 15, pardon me, Paris Agreement, a protocol, another legal instrument, or agreed outcome with legal force under the convention applicable to all parties, so we don't know what the legal form will be yet, whether that can succeed without the support of other regimes and institutions. Now, it's my thesis that there is increasingly significant activity outside the climate change regime, at least within this narrow conception of it, to address the impacts of climate change, and even indeed of climate change mitigation and adaptation responses on other areas of international environmental law, what we might call exogenous international environmental law uh, responses or activities in the climate change activity. And then, of course, beyond this, within international law as a whole. Now, I'm not going today to address the intersection of climate change and other non-environmental law areas of international law, but the intersections with human rights, refugees, migration, law of the sea, rising sea levels, etc., and trade are clearly examples of that intersection between climate change and these other areas of international law. Now, I like pictures, even though I don't have a PowerPoint, I'm going to give you a mental picture, and I think there are two ways of, of actually portraying this. One is a series of concentric circles. If we're talking about international climate change law, you could say, well, let's look at these as concentric circles, and we would have climate change as our circle in the middle, but it would intersect with human rights, it would intersect with trade, it would intersect with law of the sea, it would intersect with energy law, whatever it would populate that with, and of course with other areas of international environmental law, and so on. Another way of analyzing it is to think of an inverted pyramid, with public international law generally at the top, then through international environmental law, down to general uh, climate change regime, and even then within the climate regime, people specializing on things like emissions trading, and geoengineering as subsets within geoengineering. It ends up being like one of those Russian dolls, doesn't it? Um, although the legal significance and importance is not necessarily a function of size in this. But the interconnectedness, I think, is the point that I am trying to get across here. Now that interconnectedness and, and the, those overlaps, I think, uh, are important to bear in mind. And this is distinct, I think, from the explicit recognition within the climate regime itself
of its intersections with other areas of activity. Think of the Kyoto Protocol that left aircraft emissions to the International Civil Aviation Organization and uh, ship emissions to the IMO. And ICAO, I think, has been relatively more successful than the IMO, uh, sorry, the IMO has been relatively more successful uh, than ICAO at regulating uh, uh, greenhouse gas related emissions from shipping. So there was an acknowledgement, even the Kyoto Protocol was concluded, that there were already institutions and legal instruments that were competent to address aspects of greenhouse gas emissions uh, beyond the Kyoto Protocol. Now, within the broader field of international environmental law, without, um, with only brief acknowledgement within the Kyoto Protocol, there are a host of other multilateral environmental agreements for the protection of species and habitat, both terrestrial and marine, from the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. And we can think about things like ocean acidification or coral bleaching or impacts on other vulnerable marine species like sea turtles and the disruption to other migratory species. Um, <laughs> What's relevant here is the impact on the environment of climate change responses as well. And here I would put geoengineering in this category. If conventional mitigation doesn't work, and we talk about injecting ocean uh, iron fertilization of the oceans or sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere, there are significant consequences to the environment. The latter also may have a perturbing effect on monsoons. So it's not just, uh, of course, uh, uh, species, um, uh, animal species, but human species as well. And I should put this in parentheses. I am not for a moment by focusing on the environment and species and habitat wishing to underplay the importance of climate change responses for human beings as well. Uh, but I'll come back to that point in a moment. Well, if we try and categorize then the relationship of these um, responses within the climate regime, the endogenous responses, with these exogenous environmental responses, I think there are four possibilities that we can identify. Delegation, supplementarity, complementarity, or competition. And I'm drawing on Bedansky's work specifically for these uh, categories. Now, what, what do I and what does he mean by each of these? Well, on delegation, clearly this is where there's an explicit recognition within the climate regime of the role and responsibilities of institutions and instruments outside of it to tackle an issue. And the um, aircraft emissions through ICAO and ship emissions through the IMO is a good example of that delegation. I'm not sure I would use the word delegation, of course, in its strict legal sense. This isn't a power that the climate regime is conferring on these other bodies. It's an acknowledgement of spheres of competence that are established by the constituent instruments and the treaties that have been made pursuant to them. So we established the IMO for safer seas and cleaner oceans with its constituent instrument, and it has a whole host of treaties under its remit. This was an acknowledgement that the space was already occupied and that there would be a needless duplication or even competition of efforts were the Kyoto Protocol to tackle these particular emissions. Regrettably, there is no direct mechanism for the climate regime to mandate action by these other bodies, so they're really left at the hands of states' party to ICAO and the IMO to act uh, in these areas. The second area is supplementarity, or what I would call climate additionality. So here we're talking about really gap filling in the climate regime. It's an example where the issue is not addressed in the climate regime itself. By that I mean, for the moment, the UFCCC and the KP and subsequent decisions, etc. But it can be regulated externally. And a good example of this is black carbon, which has recently been included in the Gothenburg Protocol to the Regional Long-Range Transboundary Air Pollution Treaty uh, in the context of the Economic Commission for Europe. So that's not a global instrument, it's a regional instrument. It's our own, we don't have a global instrument on air pollution, of course, but here is a regional response to a particular source, black carbon, that was not directly addressed under the Kyoto Protocol. The third example is complementarity. So this isn't gap filling, but this is synergies 
where you can work in tandem with the climate regime to so that the sum is greater, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, hopefully, with working in train. So complementarity it would be an example where a matter is addressed in the climate regime, but work elsewhere supports it. And tackling petroleum subsidies would be a, a good example of this. If you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that flow largely from carbon-based emissions, then we need to address reducing those carbon-based emissions. Energy efficiency measures uh, might likewise come under complementarity. And then the fourth point is, is competition. Uh, and this is where there is the possibility not of positive synergies, but perhaps um, unhelpful overlaps uh, in competition, where other bodies, perhaps jockeying for positions, seek to replace the climate regime. Um, and HFC's regulation under the Montreal Protocol uh, might be one such examples. But I think in the general context of wider context of international environmental law, we're largely talking about supplementarity or additionality, the gap filling, and the working together, the complementarity. Um, and that's perhaps not surprising if we bear in mind the characterization of the climate change instruments as a subfield or part and parcel of wider international environmental law. But I think there's also a key point that that classification may unhelpfully obscure, and it's this, that there is a key difference between direct regulation of anthropogenic greenhouse gas sources and sinks, which is, of course, the role of the climate regime, and addressing what we might view as largely its ancillary causes and effects. Now, by ancillary, I mean ancillary to that primary uh, sources and sinks approach, not ancillary in the sense that they're necessarily less important, of course. So it seems to me that the principal role of what I've called exogenous MEAs, or exogenous international environmental law responses to climate change, is to enhance ecosystem resilience and adaptation to climate change, rather than directed necessarily to its underlying causes. Now, we might ask, why is there this activity? You might say, well, it's perfectly obvious why other branches of international, I don't like the word branches, why other areas of international uh, law regulating the environment would respond to climate change. And uh, I've got four you may want to add to this list. Uh, the first is the obvious multiplier effect of climate change on existing environmental issues. Uh, for example, challenges for species and habitat conservation. Um, so a number of environmental treaties view climate change as yet another threat alongside other things like increasing urbanization, building in delicate coastal areas, other sources of pollution beyond uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and so on. The second, of course, is responses, human responses to climate change um, and their impact on species and habitat. Now, that impact can be positive, for example, in terms of enhancing sinks by reducing deforestation and forest degradation. That can be positive from a forest and biodiversity point of view. Or the impact can be negative. The response I used, the response I indicated earlier of ocean iron fertilization um, in the oceans and the impact um, per perceived to be negative on marine biodiversity. The third is human ingenuity. That is to say, the role of NGOs looking for various avenues to highlight climate change impacts on vulnerable species and habitat, looking at existing tools and mechanisms and trying to bring climate change to the fore and within the fold of instruments that may not heretofore have addressed them. And I think a very interesting example here was a petition by non-governmental organizations to the World Heritage Committee requesting it to put on a list of world heritage in danger natural heritage sites like the Great Barrier Reef because of the threat of climate change to those reefs. So not just saying Australia is failing properly to protect this iconic natural heritage within its jurisdiction, but darling that a wider, more general, more diffuse anthropocentric threat needed to be addressed. Um, so that's, I think, a good example of human ingenuity using existing mechanisms.
And then the fourth, I think, is the recognition that other treaty regimes can contribute to combating climate change through their concrete impacts. And that is the point related to the point I made earlier about decreasing forest loss, maintaining forest biodiversity, and of course maintaining carbon sinks. And these factors, I think, can work together. They're not all mutually exclusive. Um, so, for example, the Convention on Migratory Species has identified the multiplier threat effect of climate change for migratory species, uh, as well as um, the impact uh, that climate change responses can have on migratory species. So it's not just the direct impacts, but the consequences on migratory species. Well, before I turn to look in a little more detail at a couple of these MEAs, I mentioned that if we're looking at the relationship between the climate change regime and its key instruments and these other environmental agreements, our starting point as good lawyers must surely be the treaty text. And I've already mentioned that the Kyoto Protocol refers or delegates to ICAO and to IMO uh, ship emissions and aircraft emissions, respectively. But what does the climate regime actually say about the environment and ecosystems? If these are indeed environmental instruments, shouldn't they be locating their activity within that environmental core in a self-reflective way? Well, in fact, if we look at the two key instruments, the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol, there are actually very few references to environment or to ecosystems. Now, let's bear in mind that the Climate Change Convention was 1992. So, yes, ecosystems had crept into international environmental legal parlance. It's not fair to criticize treaties from the 50s and 60s for not mentioning ecosystems because we hadn't really got on board with ecosystem approaches at that stage in terms of the state of environment and uh, scientific knowledge. Um, but Climate Change Convention 92, Kyoto Protocol 1997, and so on, they were concluded against a backdrop of recognition of the need to protect the environment in general and uh, ecosystems in particular. So there are a few references, but only a few, to environment uh, in the key text. The, the UNFCCC defines in Article 1 adverse effects of climate change, and in that definition, it refers to resilience or productivity of natural and managed ecosystems. Uh, so there's a recognition there of adverse climate uh, effects of climate change and ecosystems. And then Article 4 of the UNFCCC calls on parties to promote and cooperate. And let me just pause there. This is not, of course, language of the hardest sort, is it? It doesn't say shall, must, and so on. It's promote and cooperate in the conservation and enhancement of, amongst other things, terrestrial, coastal, and marine ecosystems. So those are, and of course, protection and rehabilitation, say that three times quickly, of areas particularly in Africa affected by drought. Um, so the special position of drought-affected region and different terrestrial marine uh, ecosystems uh, referred to. Those are the only two references within the UNFCCC to environment or ecosystems that we find. Um, in, within the Kyoto Protocol, um, Article 2A little 2 calls on parties to implement policies and measures to enhance greenhouse gas sinks and reservoirs, taking into account commitments under relevant international environmental agreements. So there's an obligation in enhancing and protecting sinks and reservoirs, forests, for example, mangrove swamps, to take into account. So it's not comply with to take into account. So it's quite a, a feeble language again. Uh, relevant international environmental agreements. Now, those relevant agreements are not identified, of course, within the KP itself. That perhaps would have been too limiting. It's very rare to find in instruments a listing of other agreements because these are going to change over time. A rare example is the environmental side agreement under NAFTA between Canada, the United States, and, and Mexico that has a provision for environmental instruments with trade-related mechanisms and has a list there and a mechanism for adding to it. But I think in that trade in environment and limited party participation example, it's easier to do this. Similar restraint in throwing out the big E words is found in the uh, 
current negotiating text, the 90-page heavily bracketed document uh, that came out in February. Now, Lavinia can correct me if I'm wrong, I did read through it, trying to find references to environment and ecosystem within it. And the most common place for reference is in the preambular text, and we will just recall that whatever legal form this takes, the preamble is not the binding part of the binding instrument, but can give guidance in terms of interpreting the object and purpose. So we find in the preamble references to ecosystems and their need to adapt naturally to climate change. So that's one of the strands you find in the preamble. Um, and reference also to environmental integrity. There's also, and I'm sure this won't survive in Paris, reference to the protection of the integrity of Mother Earth. Now you find Mother Earth in soft law documents, unfortunately Mother Earth usually ends up on the cutting room floor. Um, and actually I think probably environment, environmental resilience and ecosystems uh, covers it relatively well. Um, but that's just in the bracketed text on the preamble. If you then go to the general objectives uh, provisions, um, you have text similarly referring to um, the integrity of Mother Earth in the context of equitable access to sustainable development. Um, and integrity of, Mountain er of Mother Earth also pops up under mitigation provisions within it as well. Um, so someone, and doubtless you know who it was, really wanted the integrity of Mother Earth in there, um, and it pops up here and there in the bracketed text. Bolivia. Uh, yes. <laughs> Bolivia, I would have guessed. Um, in the section on adaptation, um, there's a reference to the purpose of adaptation as reducing and limiting risks caused by climate change um, for not only human beings, but for ecosystems, and a reference again to sustainable development, and again a reference to resilience and protecting ecosystems. So there's a, a recognition here in this bracketed text that environment and that species, habitat, and ecosystems will need time to adapt to increased temperatures, and I'll come on to a moment as to how easy that's going to be. Now let me say I've referred to preamble section, the general objective section, mitigation and adaptation, but of course there is a note to the negotiating text that explicitly states that these headings and subheadings are used throughout these elements for a draft negotiating text as provisional and intended only to orient the reader. So I've oriented you, uh, but they are uh, meaningless uh, for uh, legal purposes. Well, let me say two things about this. One is that I don't think the Climate Change Convention, the Kyoto Protocol, or this negotiating text is all that unusual. It may seem odd, but in the general corpus of text within the umbrella of what some would call international environmental law, environment doesn't get mentioned that often. Why not? Because we don't have a treaty on the environment per se. They tend to be addressing specific, specific species or habitat or environmental problems to which we give a more precise name, air pollution, um, or prior informed consent with respect to uh, pesticides and so on. Um, so in this I don't mean to suggest that the climate change and Kyoto Protocol are somehow outliers from other MEAs. This is relatively common. And indeed, if we look for a general obligation to protect and preserve the marine envir of the environment, ha, I gave it away, um, <laughs> The one common example, of course, is Article 192 of the Law of the Sea Convention, which recognizes the general obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. But we have no global instrument that does something comparable for the environment per se. So in some respects, international laws like domestic environmental laws were, laws were in their infancy, where you do it by specific media, or environmental problems, so air pollution, water pollution, land-based pollution, or specific um, pollution problems, rather than having that sort of holistic regulation. But there's another reason here, I think, for why there's relatively little mention in these instruments uh, to the environment. I think one is philosophically what Mary Medley calls the no lifeboat option that a general commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to achieve stabilization of global temperatures will benefit both human and non-human species alike. Now this may be seen as a rather anthropocentric viewpoint, but I think there's a kernel of truth in that. Um, another, I think, is that the UNFCCC 
Obviously, the states negotiating it knew that they weren't negotiating in, an eva in, in a vacuum, as its preamble clearly reflects, but they were aware, of course, that there were other instruments out there and that there would continue to be law building and implementation and enforcement in other areas of environmental activity, with that direct cross-reference in the Kyoto Protocol to uh, relevant international environmental agreements. Um, I think for this reason, and of course, post-1992, the practical collaboration between MEAs. Um, before there was a bidding war for hosting the secretariats of these new instruments, they had temporary housing in Geneva, and I thought how wonderful it must have been just to pop across from one building to the other, or across floors, for, for secretariats to talk to one another. But then the bidding war began to host these treaty secretariats, so the Biodiversity Convention is in Montreal. Um, now, Montreal is a beautiful city. I'm Canadian. What a wonderful place to have the CBD. It can talk to ICAO, but pretty much no one else uh, within <laughs> Canada. Um, and the IMO, of course, is based in London. Um, Climate Change Secretariat? Bon. Bon, yeah. It can talk to the Migratory Species Convention. Um, but the practical reality of already overstretched and under-resourced secretariats being the main link for co cooperation and synergies between these instruments, I think, is deeply problematic. And it's symptomatic of what we might call the sort of deformalization of aspects of international environmental law, that it falls to these more ad hoc and soft law arrangements to try and foster these synergies uh, between them. Um, so although bilateral memoranda of understanding have been concluded amongst the key treaty secretariats, um, there are very significant practical obstacles. And of course, this is always value added, isn't it? If you're an embattled secretariat under the Migratory Species Convention or the Biodiversity Convention, Yes, climate change has been integrated into your day-to-day -day business, but your day-to-day -day business is biodiversity conservation or conservation of migratory species. So climate change is just one string to that bow. Okay, I'm conscious of time moving on. Um, so um, the advantages of cooperation between these MEAs and the climate regime is, as I've said, enhancing synergies and reducing duplication of effort and promoting resource efficiency. Um, but it seems to me that these bilateral exchanges and memorandum of understanding are really only scratching the surface. Um, and it's really been left to the initiative of the individual treaties and their secretariats, as I'll highlight in a moment, to themselves look out to climate change and assess what the impacts are internally on their core central work. So it seems to me two related points can already be made clear. The first is that the single most important contribution that the climate change regime can make to the protection of species and habitat is actually to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions. There's no doubt about that. And of course, to address uh, adaptation. Now that is a task that clearly falls outside the scope of other multilateral environmental agreements. It falls squarely within the climate regime to address. Um, it is uniquely poised to address the reduction of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the round. Secondly, that while most MEAs can only address the effects or impacts of climate change, but not the root causes, nonetheless, MEAs do have a potentially significant contribution to make, particularly when it comes to enhancing and protecting greenhouse gas sinks and reservoirs. Um, and that's in the context of reducing desertification, and also in terms of wetlands. So I'd just like to turn, if I may, briefly for five or ten minutes to talk about MEAs and then draw some concluding remarks, and then I'm happy to elaborate on any of these points in the uh, questions and discussion. Because I said we need to look at what the climate regime says about um, other MEAs and the environment. What have these other MEAs been doing with respect to climate change? Um, well, um, in my written paper, I go through a number of reports that have emanated from the secretariats and from um, other uh, environmental bodies, highlighting the adverse effects of climate change um, impacts and responses on species and habitat. So what are MEAs doing about uh, these impacts? Well, as I mentioned before, 
Today, most major environmental treaties are addressing the impacts of climate change as part of their routine or day-to-day -day business. Why do I say most and not all? Well, there is an issue here of what the treaty itself provides in terms of its object and purpose and the extent to which addressing climate change impacts fits within the object and purpose of the instrument. And I'm thinking here in particular of CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Um, it, of the major multilateral environmental agreements, has been the least concerned with climate change impacts because its central focus is the adverse effects of trade on endangered species. And it uses trade-related mechanisms uh, to achieve its purpose. Um, however, the listing of species on the appendices, and listing is, of course, the central regulatory tool of CITES, is based on scientific assessment. And climate change has an impact on the science and the underpinnings of the appendices listing process. So whilst some parties have been reluctant to see what they see as mission creep of CITES to embrace climate change impacts within it, the majority view of the CITES parties has been that there are indirect impacts of climate change on species that may exacerbate the threats posed by trade and the consequent endangerment of those species so that climate change is part of the endangerment package alongside um, trade. Um, so the impacts of climate change has become part of strategic planning in CITES, but it's been a relatively muted response. We can contrast that with other instruments where it's clear that climate change impacts are part of their day-to-day -day business, either because it's seen as a threat multiplier and migratory species, the conventional migratory species would be a good example here, or because of the complementarity and synergies between instruments the Biodiversity Convention and the Desertification Convention, and what sought to be done within the climate regime itself. So I come back to the example of carbon sinks and reservoirs. So deforestation, um, reforestation, forest biodiversity, clearly something that overlaps between the climate regime and Red Plus and the biodiversity regime. Another example is the Ramsar Convention, which is addressed to wetlands of importance to wild birds. It was concluded in Ramsar and Iran back in 1971, and it takes a wetlands conservation approach. Now, mangrove swamps can be an important source of carbon sink, and the Ramsar Secretariat has actually advised the climate regime on the capacity of mangrove swamps to uh, perform this function. So I think it's particularly on the, um, on the sinks aspect that we see synergies between them and, of course, on climate change impacts um, in the context of migratory species. And then the last example I would use is the one I referred to earlier, which is the World Heritage Convention. That 2005 petition by NGOs to the World Heritage Committee. Now let me just pause there. There's no formal mechanism for non-state parties to petition the World Heritage Committee. But of course, the World Heritage Committee um, makes up its own rules sometimes as it goes along. Oh dear, this is being taped, isn't it? Um, <laughs> the World Heritage Committee was petitioned by these NGOs and that highlighted for the World Heritage Convention the need to look again at its operational guidelines because they didn't, of course, refer explicitly to climate change and the assessment of climate change impacts. Think of Venice and the rising seawater, the Venice Lagoon or the Great Barrier Reef, for example. It tends to be natural heritage and cultural heritage in the context of Venice that are both adversely affected. So the World Heritage Convention amended its operational guidelines to require parties explicitly to consider the impact of climate change on existing natural heritage sites and cultural sites. Now, India has 32 listed properties, 25 cultural and 7 natural. None of them are mixed, so far as I could tell. 
Um, none are on the danger list. Well done. Uh, there are 46 properties on the danger list, but no Indian properties there. Uh, so all in good nick in terms of their outstanding universal value. Um, now query whether, I think as far as the cultural properties are concerned, there are not as yet any climate change impacts. But for the natural heritage, again, this is a watching brief. And as a party to the World Heritage Convention, it is an obligation on India and other states' party to the, the World Heritage Convention to continue to assess the impacts on World Heritage Sites, now including climate change impacts. Similarly, when it comes to inscribing properties away from the World Heritage List to the danger list, uh, to the danger list, um, we find that uh, climate change impacts may be one exacerbating factor that now can explicitly be taken into account. Now, there hasn't yet been a property danger listed owing to climate change impacts alone. There is a petroleum example. The first property ever to be delisted was um, the Arabian Oryk Sanctuary in Oman because of increased licensing of petroleum activities. So um, there is a carbon-based example there, but not a, not a climate change one. But there is the possibility under the World Heritage Convention now uh, both to ensure that impact is assessed, that impact is in the public domain, and for danger listing to occur. So in summary, I think there are seven responses that MEAs um, have taken in the context of climate change. And some of these, of course, um, these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. The first I would call is more information. Every single MEA goes, we need to know more about the impacts of climate change. We need more monitoring, we need more research. Now that is not cost neutral, and as we know, baseline monitoring and impacts is costly and often difficult to do. How do you know what the impact of climate change or anything else for that matter is unless you have the baseline data against which to assess it? Um, and that research includes identifying particularly vulnerable populations. So the first is more information, more research. The second is resili resilience and adaptation, so the need to build further species and habitat resilience and ecosystem resilience to be able to adapt to climate change impacts. And that's within the compass of the object and purpose of each MEA. The third is response mechanisms. How do we respond to these threats to vulnerable species, in particular posed and habitats posed by climate change? So the development of response mechanisms, uh, including integration, of course, into existing management plans for protected areas. The fourth is institutional cooperation. Uh, by this I mean cooperation inter se, that is amongst the MEAs, so improving that cooperation that I already highlighted, but also with other organizations, so outside of MEAs, with the World Bank and even public-private partnerships. So that's my fifth point, further external cooperation and outreach, um, including at climate change COPs themselves. The sixth is related to um, my point on response mechanisms, and this is rescue operations. The polar bear can only find so much more ice. In terms of subarctic plants and animals, once they get to the top of the mountain, there's nowhere else to do. These are um, latitude and uh, altitude problems for certain species. They've adapted as far as they can, and there's nowhere else to go. So you may need an emergency uh, response, a rescue response. Now, there are some examples of endangered species rescue and relocation in international law um, under what we call sort of extremities issues. Um, so the Migratory Species Convention with CBD. Uh, one example uh, is the Great Apes Project. Another was what was called Operation Noah's Ark. Um, after the end of the Angolan Civil War, a number of species were gathered up from South Africa in particular and used to repopulate Angola. Um, so there might be an Operation Noah's Ark or similar. Now these are clearly extreme responses to extreme, indeed catastrophic events with respect to uh, particular species and habitat. And of course this all needs to be put in the mix against other emergency responses. So in conclusion, um, those are seven responses that we can map onto existing instruments. Um, there are some techniques, I think, that require modification. One is protected areas. This is a very common environmental tool domestically and internationally. Why do you protect an area? 
If it's migratory species, it might be footprints or corridors, because that's where your migratory species migrates within, or that's where your particularly sensitive or vulnerable habitat or species are located. But with climate change, this will not necessarily be a static picture. So protected areas and buffer zones may need to be more flexible and adaptable um, as species and, and habitat themselves adapt through ecosystem resilience. So we can't have a rigid or fixed view, I think, of protected areas management over time. And that's particularly the case, I think, for migratory species. They may change their flight pathways. They may change their migratory routes. The second point is the increased use of danger listing, which states don't like much because it looks bad when your World Heritage Site is put on a danger list or the Montreux record under the Ramsar Convention. But it's a way of highlighting that there's a problem and of course, these treaties also have trust funds. So once a, pro a property has been danger listed in a particular area, you can leverage trust funds under Ramsar or under the World Heritage Convention for their protection. So this might work synergistically with climate change responses. And the third key tool is environmental impact assessment to integrate climate change impacts within that. And not just for projects, of course, and activities, but also strategic environmental impact assessment of legislation, policies, plans, and programs. What we don't have well developed is the emergency adaptation tools that I referred to earlier. And of course, at the other end of the scale, um, climate change, litigation, responsibility, liability. This is, of course, the least developed and perhaps the least likely area at the international level significantly to evolve in the context of species extinction and habitat damage in consequence of uh, climate change impacts. Um, and I'm quite happy to return to that point in the questions. Well, to come back then in conclusion to the points I made at the outset about the intersection between climate change and other areas of general international environmental law and international law more broadly, um, it seems to me that if action to combat climate change and its effects has led to horizontal cross-fertilization of climate issues, so not just environment, but trade, investment, human rights, and peace and security, there is, of course, a risk that climate change law and or the climate change regime becomes hopelessly broad, that climate change starts to lose any sort of central focus or importance. The flip side, of course, is that one can identify a contrary trend to atomization or fragmentation, the focus on specialized or discrete areas I mentioned earlier, like emissions trading and geoengineering um, or carbon capture and storage. Um, now, it seems to me that the uh, difficulty here is that the conception of climate change law within the broader remit of international environmental law needs to be thought of in broad terms itself. That is to say, those that argue for a delinkage of climate change from international environmental law to broaden our horizons so that we can think innovatively about climate change solutions that aren't just environmental, fails to appreciate that international environmental law itself embraces the totality of international law in its application to the environment. So I don't personally espouse the delinking of climate change from international environmental law. What I do espouse is the necessity to see climate change as part of that pyramid or that set of concentric circles that I mentioned earlier. And the gap that I see that is not addressed through the synergies between MEAs or indeed through the evolution of the climate regime narrowly confined to the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol is how you go about budgeting, not your carbon budget, but your climate change response and adaptation budget that brings in these wider issues of food security, migration, climate <coughs> justice, and so on. And that is, I think, one of the general problems of public international law as a decentralized horizontal legal order that we confront in our day-to-day -day work, but which climate change is our super wicked global problem, serves once again rather violent, violently perhaps to underscore. And I will conclude on that point and look forward to your questions and comments.